Hello. Welcome to our latest knowledge translation video. This one is for our recent study published in Applied Physiology, Nutrition, and Metabolism. My name is Neil Morley, and I'll be guiding this video. The title of our study today is Training Response to 8 Weeks of Blood Flow Restricted Training is Not Improved by Preferentially Altering Tissue Hypoxia or Lactate Accumulation When Training to Repetition Failure. This paper comes from work done by Shane Firth during his Master of Science degree in the Department of Human Health and Nutritional Sciences. Let's start with some background information. There is evidence to suggest that low load blood flow restriction training, that is, performing resistance exercise while wearing a blood pressure cuff around the exercising limb, is a more effective way to increase muscle size and strength than the same load without blood flow restriction. However, despite the benefits of low load blood flow restriction training, or BFR, the specific way in which it causes changes isn't entirely clear. Two of the suggested ways it may be doing so are the reduced oxygen availability at the muscle, due to less blood flow into the muscle, and the accumulation of metabolites, or waste products, due to less blood flow out of the muscle. The problem is that it's very hard to separate these two potential mechanisms from one another to measure their respective effects. How do we hold one of these variables steady while changing the other? Another source of ambiguity in BFR literature is the use of different experimental models. Some studies will have their control exercise group do the same number of sets and reps as the BFR group, while others try to match the work done between groups, or the volume. Some groups use blood pressure cuffs to stop the blood flow to the limb entirely, or just halfway, or anywhere in between. All this variation means two things. Firstly, that there is room for different protocols to target different potential mechanisms. And secondly, that there is room for optimizing BFR so practitioners can maximize their potential gains. Enter our study. Because blood pressure in the veins is far lower than blood pressure in the arteries, we hypothesized that we could set a blood pressure cuff at a pressure high enough to stop the blood flow out of the limb in the veins, but low enough to leave blood flow into the limb relatively intact. This would mean that our participants in this group would have some oxygen supply to the working muscle, but no blood flow out of the limb, causing an accumulation of metabolites. In essence, changing one thing without substantially changing the other. We wanted to see if participants who resistance trained this way would have a different change than participants who trained with a cuff pressure that stops blood in both directions, and further, if that was different than participants who just trained normally. To do this, we recruited participants to three different groups. Traditional resistance training, 100% occlusion pressure, that is, with 100% of the pressure required to stop blood flow in and out of their limb, and a group with 50% occlusion pressure, which had cuffs at 50% of that pressure. We measured baseline strength, size, and muscular endurance in the leg, and then had our three groups perform leg extension resistance training three times a week for eight weeks, and measured the same things afterwards. Our participants in each group performed three sets of 10 repetitions and a final fourth set to failure. By bringing each group to task failure, we essentially matched for intensity as opposed to volume or work. During a representative exercise session, we also measured blood lactate in the exercising limb, which we used as a proxy for metabolite accumulation. During this same exercise session, we also measured tissue saturation with near-infrared spectroscopy, which gives us an idea of how much oxygen is in the exercising limb. These two measurements gave us an idea of whether there were substantial changes to our two variables of interest due to the different cuff pressures. Let's look at some results. We found that all groups increased the size and strength of their muscles as well as their muscular endurance with no group significantly outperforming any other. This suggests that there is no further benefit to resistance training with 100% occlusion pressure compared to 50% occlusion pressure, and that both of these options are comparable to traditional resistance training if the tasks are taken to failure. When we looked at the tissue saturation and blood lactate measurements, we were surprised to see that 50% occlusion pressure did not actually result in significantly greater tissue saturation than the 100% occlusion pressure. Indeed, if we consider the accumulated deoxygenation stress, which we calculate as the tissue desaturation multiplied by the time spent desaturated, it was in fact greater in the 50% occlusion pressure group than the 100% group. That said, with neither tissue saturation index nor blood lactate concentration changing differently between groups, we have determined that altering cuff pressure alone may not be sufficient to disentangle these two potential mechanisms from one another and their contributions to blood flow restriction training. 
Future research could look at accumulated deoxygenation stress and muscle changes, and how changing the cuff pressure may alter these adaptations. Thanks for stopping by, and if you're interested in learning more, check out the link to the article below. Thank you.